So, good uh, afternoon, good evening, or good day, one and all. This is another one of the CLA and Bar Council of England and Wales uh, discussions with one of the Commonwealth regions. Uh, today finds us in the Caribbean, and we have participants from uh, Barbados, uh, Rosalind from Trinidad and Tobago, Douglas, and two participants, but wearing different hats from the Bahamas. Uh, we're very pleased that Peter Maynard, our Vice President for the Americas, is with us, and Council Member for the Caribbean, uh, Bertha, is also present. Uh, we have been conducting these discussions with our regions, and uh, we have had a discussion with the Africa hub region and with Asia. And so we're looking very much to learning something about what is going on in the Caribbean, arising from the impact of the global pandemic known as COVID-19, in particular, considering the impact in your region on the administration of justice. In addition to Derek Sweeting, QC Vice Chair of the Bar Council of England and Wales, we have Christian Viskirchen, who is the International Officer for the Bar Council of England and Wales and a member of the CLA Executive Committee. So we're looking forward to uh, learning from you as to what steps have been taken in your region, uh, to sharing concerns and to maybe sharing a little bit of what's going on in the respective parts of the UK from which uh, Derek and I are, are from. So without any more ado, uh, Derek, could you introduce yourself and maybe lead off the discussion uh, that we have in mind? Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Well, I'm Derek Sweeting. I'm Vice Chair of the Bar of England and Wales, and I've been elected as Chair for next year. So it's a pleasure to be here with other Bar leaders. As Brian said, this is the third of these events that have taken place over Zoom. It's always a pleasure, I think, to feel that you're traveling to somewhere else, even if you're only doing that via the internet. One of the things which has emerged, I think, in the public health sphere is that although we all face very similar problems in terms of the effect of the virus, different countries have used different solutions with different degrees of success. And I think it would be fair to say that we've found so far that that is also true of the legal position and the way in which different legal um, structures and different countries have reacted to the pandemic and its effect on access to justice. So let me just give you, as it were, the headlines from the, uh, the UK um, today. That's really that this week has marked the start of an attempt to restart jury trials. And of course, of all of the trials that one could um, envisage trying to stage during a pandemic, jury trials probably come with the, the most difficulties. So in the Old Bailey this week, two trials are going to go ahead with juries and that involves a great deal of social distancing and some very impressive attempts to try and make sure that jurors and court users including members of the legal profession and witnesses as well as defendants of course are as comfortable as they can be with the precautions which have been taken around health but the caveat is that in a very large building it's only two trials and these are very much baby steps so we are not looking at the dam bursting all of a sudden and jury trials resuming. So it's a tentative way of trying to begin things again in the criminal sphere. And of course, it would be right to say that the amount of work that goes on in court in terms of hearings has really fallen off a cliff as a result of the lockdown in this country and I'm sure elsewhere. And although we are beginning now to see a return to hearings in the criminal courts, it's going to be very slow on any view. The civil courts, in fact, have, have not done much better. In theory, they ought to be more amenable to the use of technology and video hearings and so on. But it's proved to be the case that there are certain sorts of hearings which are just not really viable via a video link. 
and the use of video links themselves come with a real downside. They're quite tiring, they're difficult, not everybody wants to participate in the normal way. So I would say that the position in relation to the civil courts is again that there has been a very large downturn and we are still feeling our way really back towards a recovery. And overarching all of this in terms of attending hearings in person is not just the difficulties that one faces in terms of safety at court, but also traveling to court, for example, and trying to be safe on the way to court. So those are the sorts of problems that we're encountering at the moment. So can I ask Peter really just to give us an overview of what the position is within your jurisdiction? Thank, thank you, Derek. And, and let me say at the outset, uh, thank you to Brian and yourself, as, as well as Bridget and Christian, and, and uh, for this initiative in organizing this um, this event. Um, as you, as you and, and Brian have indicated, this this is this pandemic has been very life changing, uh, uh, not just globally and certainly across the region. The English speaking Caribbean. And, and, and Douglas can, can correct me on this. I think the, the English-speaking uh, countries are about 17 of them, extending from Bermuda, if you wish, uh, and the Bahamas in the north, to Trinidad and Guyana in the south, and Barbados in the east to Belize in, in the west. So it's, it's quite a broad, a broad region. Um, um, but, um, and so the measures have varied. Uh, in in uh, places such as St. Lucia, uh, and in, uh, the, this, uh, the curve is, is, is flattened. Indeed, recently in the Bahamas, there have been, been no cases over the past few days, which has been very, very encouraging. Um, um, but the, it's, this is still a, a matter which will take some time to, to um, complete, uh, obviously. There's now the phase reopening of the economy, the government has taken various measures to gradually reopen the economy. I think Roslyn has the privilege of being able to get back to her office more frequently than the rest, or more easily than the rest of us can, perhaps in, in the region. Um, as, as, as for the courts, the responses of the courts have been, been varied across the, the, re, the region. Um, on, the, on the criminal side, uh, generally speaking, it seems as that uh, these, the criminal trials are not continuing for the moment, uh, although uh, there are uh, arraignments. Uh, and of course, this may vary from, from place to place um, using video uh, methods. And some countries are more equipped than others in, in, in the use of, of technology. Uh, on, on the civil side, uh, the, the courts have, um, in many cases, uh, identified judges who uh, consists of an urgent duty roster. That's the name used in the Bahamas, for example, urgent duty roster, where judges are available to deal with urgent matters and they are holding um, hearings by video conference uh, using various platforms. Um, in some instances, uh, e-filing is available. In other instances, uh, there's greater use of um, uh, use of emails, uh, and there are challenges of this. We have we have the Caribbean Court of Justice, as as you may know, which is a, uh, the primary court of the Caribbean, uh, which is very very advanced in electronic methods, and other countries have, have followed suit in their domestic courts, uh, and so um, uh, many courts are quite well equipped uh, to deal with these the new challenges. Um, and so uh, that's uh, uh, the we're finding the countries of the region are adapting quite um, quite quickly. Uh, and indeed, many people are saying we we ought to have been doing a lot of this, a lot more of this in the first place in terms of the use of technology. Uh, and I'm sure that that, that uh, the uh, and indeed we're speaking now of, of not just reopening but also of reimagining. Um, how our, our, our judicial sectors may operate. 
Peter, thank you, thank you for that, that very succinct uh, summary of what's happening in the region on a regional basis. And I think the last point you made is one that has come out of, of a lot of our discussions, which is around what the new normal will be, how many of these changes will remain in place, and how much of a, a difference they will make going forward. I have to say, I, I feel sometimes that over here, we're in a large laboratory at the moment where lots of things are being tried, in a timescale which we couldn't have imagined only a year ago. So let's go over to Rosalind and get the view from Barbados. Thank you, Derek. Um, in Barbados, I have to say that this pandemic has taken us completely by surprise and we absolutely were not prepared for anything like this. The effect on the legal profession has been profound. Um, the suddenness with which we, we found ourselves under an effective lockdown meant that lawyers went home one day and couldn't go back to get their files, even though they could work from home. Um, that made it difficult to participate in um, trials and hearings, even if they wanted to. The technology was not in place to facilitate, uh, I would say, the majority of the kinds of hearings. We've not been able to have any criminal trials at all, um, other than in the magistrate's courts where it, the situation is a little more flexible. Um, in the civil arena, what the bar did was try to take the initiative to find a way in which lawyers could easily communicate to the registry what cases they had coming up whether they thought they were amenable to remote hearing, whether by telephone or video conferencing, whether they were willing and able to do so. And that was of assistance to the registry and the judges, I think, to help organize which cases had to be adjourned and which ones had a possibility of even taking the next step in the process. Rosalind, Last week- sorry, sorry to cut across, but I see uh, Khalil, have you joined us and can you hear? Yes, I can. Thank you. Good morning, all. Okay, well, uh, we'll let Rosalind finish. If you, Khalil, could maybe go on to mute, that would be great. And then I'll introduce you properly in a short while. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I was saying that last week, um, some of us had the privilege of participating in a regional call organized by the Caribbean Court of Justice, where all of the jurisdictions were welcome to come and share their experiences, solutions that had been found, um, look at common ways of dealing with problems because all of our legal systems are basically set up in much the same way. Um, in terms of the, the use of technology, we are making some progress with that. We had not had an e-filing capacity until now, but we hope to launch that very soon. Uh, so that we can continue to work remotely. Um, because legal services were not deemed as essential, we had to wait until last week, until we were given permission to go back to our offices to provide services that support businesses. It's not even a full opening. And of course, the effect that this has had on the lawyers themselves, their ability to, to earn money has been profound. I am aware that the UK bar has done a survey of its members and some of the results of that. And we here in Barbados are considering organizing a similar survey to see from the, from the lawyer's perspective, what effect it's had on them and what effect it's had on their client's business. Um, I think that is it for my introductory remarks. Thank you. Well, Rosalind, thank you so much. I think one of the things which I think came out of what you have told us as a theme is really the position of the profession. We were fairly effective early on in this country in getting lawyers designated as key workers or essential workers, which made a real difference to things like access to office premises, and indeed access to the courts when we were in a very significant degree of, of lockdown. And we have found on in the course of these events are going around the globe, that there are differences between jurisdictions. And that difference in particular is a very significant one in terms of how effective lawyers can be.
during a pandemic. So let me just go, and go back to Brian now. I think you're going to introduce Khalil, who's just joined us. Uh, yes, Khalil, lovely to see you and uh, good morning. Um, uh, just so that everyone else on, on both the, um, the call now and listening knows, Khalil is the president of the Bahamas Bar Association. So we are very fortunate to have bar leaders and certainly whenever I take over the, the helm from Derek after he's uh, spoken to the other participants, I will want to return to the theme that Rosalind has very helpfully introduced, which is the impact on colleagues the instant nature of our work uh, really falling away completely. And I also want to broaden the discussion uh, to include transactional work, uh, helping clients with wills or if they are incapacitated in some way, uh, the ordinary work of uh, law offices around the Commonwealth has been impacted uh, and not just through uh, court-based work, so, Khalil, it is nice to see you. We will join you after Derek has spoken to uh, Douglas uh, and Bertha, and then we'll, we'll have a, a word from you, and then I'll come in with some follow-up discussion with each of you. Back to you, Derek. Thank you, Brian. And Douglas, I wanted to ask you next to give a thumbnail picture, if you would, of what the position is in your jurisdiction and in particular in relation to access to the courts and the effect of the pandemic on that. Thank you very much, Derek. The, the judiciary has responded to our lockdown, and I put that in inverted commas, uh, because the approach of this government has been uh, essentially to not to require everyone to stay at home, but simply to prohibit certain activities and they divided up um, working activities into essential and non-essential um, services. From the word go, they included legal services among the essential services. So lawyers have been um, permitted to, 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 you know, to work, although the extent to which they have done so is, is, um, is not known. Certainly I have been working from home for the last nearly eight weeks. But the, what the judiciary has done is essentially to shut down the courts um, with the exception of what they refer to as emergency matters, but included among those that would be, would be heard automatically would be domestic violence cases, applications for, bails, for bail, uh, maintenance applications. But as I say, generally speaking, uh, emergency matters, which um, they essentially is left to the individual judge to determine whether it was emergency matter. One of the cases that did go to court was an application by a very prominent and, and famous, some say infamous uh, radio announcer, <coughs> radio program host, who had tested positive and, uh, and then he claimed that after he was put in quarantine and after he, after he says he was tested negative, they wouldn't allow him to leave. So a habeas corpus application was made to court and it, and it was heard and um, determined, it, well, eventually he withdrew it because his result turned out to be positive after all. So that there has been limited access to the courts. The courts, the judiciary has also responded by effectively moving to e-filing, which would be a permanent feature, it's intended to be a permanent feature of, um, of the court system going forward. Um, we have had a number of meetings um, over Zoom with the bar. We host, the Law Association hosted a, a webinar, which was attended by upwards of 600 people, and even more on, on Facebook, in which the judiciary discussed the, the, their move towards um, virtual hearings, e-filings, and so on. Um, of course, as far as that is concerned, there are a lot of problems that will have to be sorted out. Uh, it's not clear that the judiciary has the capacity to um, conduct a virtual hearings, certainly not from the courtrooms, because they, they don't have sufficient audiovisual equipment. So thus far, um, I have participated in two hearings, but I could tell the judge was, um, was at home and therefore using his, and in the other case, her uh, private computer equipment. Um, 
but exactly uh, how they're going to do it going forward will depend upon the resources that the government eventually provides. The other problem that is, of course, whether members of the public who are, have to participate in the proceedings or who are interested in, in, in witnessing the proceedings as they are entitled to, will have the technology to be able to, to um, log in to the hearing. But there's also the problem as to whether lawyers will have the necessary technology. That is not to be assumed. I assume that um, most lawyers, if not all, would have um, a computer and should be able to log in, but whether they would have the appropriate bandwidth, whether they'd have the appropriate um, software, um, all that is up in, up in the air. The Law Association has responded to that we have set up a subcommittee to receive um, submissions from um, members of the bar or outlying sub-organizations uh, as to how the association itself can assist members who are experiencing difficulties. As a matter of fact, we have a council meeting this afternoon in which we are going to receive the report from the subcommittee. One of the things that has been bandied about is that the law association itself will, will um, create uh, centers, at three or four points in the country where video conferencing can be held, maybe for a small fee, and also where the necessary equipment would be provided to scan documents that need to be filed, and maybe the software that is needed, all this fancy software that I'm not too familiar with, in which you can cross-reference documents and so on. Um, so we are we are considering we we are now trying to cost it to see if it's something that we can afford, um, so that it, it will be made available to to the members of the profession who don't have that sort of equipment themselves. The I don't think that there have been any um, criminal trials, certainly not no jury trials so far, and the attorney general has responded by um, sending around recently. Um, uh, a question basically um, for the consideration of the members members of the profession as to whether we should go to at least for a temporary period um, abolishing jury trials and mandating judge alone trials the law in Trinidad at the moment is that um, we have judge alone trials if the defense um, requests it and there have been some judge alone trials apparently they have they have worked um, fairly well um, from the reports from both sides of the bar and from the, ju the judiciary. So the Attorney General has asked the question whether if only temporarily we can, um, we can mandate that all trials, jury trials um, be, held, be heard by, the, by a judge alone. Because we, I, I don't think that we have been able to envisage how to conduct a jury trial and at the same time maintain um, social distancing. Or to be able to conduct a jury trial virtually There'll be all the difficulties concerning witnesses, whether they be prompted by somebody off camera, uh, whether the witnesses themselves have the, the, the necessary technology, et cetera, et cetera, which I think is a problem being experienced everywhere. So that is one of the issues that, um, that has been flagged in Trinidad and, and is currently under discussion. Um, it was a, an issue that was discussed on the uh, virtual meeting that Rosalind mentioned earlier um, that was hosted by the CCJ. And that is a debate, therefore, that is also occurring region-wide. As far as the impact upon on the profession, um, I have had, well, I can only go on, on the basis of, of um, what some members have reported, and, and certainly the, the bigger firms, the commercial firms, as it were, have reported an 80% reduction in commercial work, um, and I think the 60% in one instance reduction in income over the period. Of course, there's, there's no new litigation taking place. And you can expect as well that during this period, clients are not paying because everybody's waiting to see what is going to happen next. So there is, um, there is an expected impact upon the, the earnings in the profession. But exactly what, what that is, we don't know. We, have, we don't have the, the information and we haven't yet attempted to get that information um, from the profession. But we assume we are assuming that there is an impact, and we are uh, attempting to to adjust as best as possible. As far as it, if I may just say this um, lastly, as far as the um, use of technology is concerned, um, I don't see any reason why once it is available, it wouldn't work. As a matter of fact, I did a a, a trial 
in Guyana, I was in Trinidad. Um, Dr. Francis Alexis, who represented one another party, was in Grenada. And the trial, the, the court um, assembled with the necessary technology and we made submissions to the, the High Court and then to the Court of Appeal. Um, and it, it went fairly well, but of course we didn't have any witnesses to, to cross-examine. This was just submissions. Um, and um, it, indica it shows that it, it can work, um, but it all depends upon the availability of um, appropriate technology. I think that those are the um, those are the points that I wanted to make. Thanks very much, Derek. Yeah, Douglas, thank you very much. I mean, lots of access to justice issues arising there around the patchy nature of technology, whether judges as well as lawyers and litigants are going to be in a position to use it. And then I thought the other very interesting thing was the question of what work is regarded as urgent, which has been something of um, a difficulty here as well, because there are different views between the judiciary and the profession, I think, about what ought to be regarded as work that can be done and is urgent. So in, interesting thoughts there from Douglas. Let's go over to, to Bertha for some thoughts from, from your end. Thank you very much, Derek. Uh, interesting enough, prior to the pandemic, I've been working with um, several subcommittees in the Bahamas um, that sent us around ADR ref legislative reforms. And one of the committees, uh, well, arbitration, mediation, adjudication, financial services, and youth ADR. And when this outbreak occurred, I was very concerned based on the feedback from the young professionals who expressed an anxiety. Some of them have been laid off and without any means to practice in the courts, they all turn to their respective responsibilities. And as a result of these committees, I've seized the opportunity to stir the interest in the, particularly the mediation aspect, because our CJ is very keen as he introduces new CPR rules to implement mediation. And my concern overall was what are the solutions? How are we going to respond to the young professionals, particularly? And, um, as you would know, I don't know, but I've spoken with Brian on several occasions as counsel for the Caribbean. One of my main concerns was to focus on the mediation. So I would say that in terms of solutions, um, the courts are shut, but I sit on international panels and arbitration in the international arbitration space, as well as mediation, one has continued to exist. And I look at this as an ideal opportunity to train and to educate those in our profession, to look at alternative means to resolve disputes. I mean, in terms of criminal um, matters, we can understand, but I'm looking particularly for civil matters. This is an opportunity for the CLA to, you know, establish its footprint in the ADR sector. I will allow um, Khalil to expand further what has been taking place on the ground, seeing that he has been in close communication with the CJ. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, Bertha. That's fascinating. Uh, I think the, the idea that we need to innovate in the face of the problems that are coming our way both at the moment and when we are dealing with the backlog of course I think is is a common thread in a lot of the discussions we've been having just as Douglas was saying that we might have to innovate in terms of how we do jury trials in other words do we do away with juries I think the role of mediation and ADR is another area where there's going to be a lot of discussion and thought about its role and effectiveness in dealing with the backlog in particular so shall we go over to Khalil Brown before you take over? Uh, yes, I, I think we should. Uh, just to allow um, Khalil to uh, come up on video there. 
um, responding very positively to your remarks, uh, Bertha. Um, I do think this is an opportunity for practitioners to advance their cases towards a resolution. Uh, and in a sense, it's, it's one of the uh, interesting aspects of how we need to be flexible in our approach. I mean, we may never go back to the courts operating the way we have been used to throughout our professional lives, but um, online mediation, Zoom mediations, uh, I'm pleased to say I have uh, two lined up in the next couple of weeks. It will be interesting to see how they go. I actually have no concerns about this as being a highly effective opportunity for colleagues to move stuck cases or cases which uh, are ripe for resolution and settlement. And um, my own law society has produced uh, an um, e-informer circular to all members of the profession in Northern Ireland, uh, extolling the virtues of mediation. Uh, and you can guess that I've had a little bit of a hand in promoting that uh, because of my interest in that. So I was very intrigued, Bertha, to hear what you say. And I think at a, at a CLA uh, level, we should be encouraging how different working practices can evolve, um, even though going to court may not continue to be so much a part. So I'll, uh, I see Khalil is there, and as president of the uh, Bahamas Bar, Derek, you might uh, lead into a discussion with Khalil now. Yes, Khalil, do you want to give us a, a pen picture then from the Bahamas as to how the pandemic is uh, affecting you? Yes, good morning, everybody. Um, while I had some short notice with respect to this due to some electronic issues, the reality is as presidents, we discuss this stuff every day. This is our, our primary work right now. So I, I can't pretend like I'm not prepared for the discussion. Um, I caught the tail end of Rosalind's presentation and I got all of Douglas's and it seems as though we have had, as probably can be anticipated, somewhat universal experiences with respect to um, getting through this. Uh, we have been back in our offices for about two weeks um, with the, an extension having been secured for the legal profession. We're not open, but we've been allowed in, the premise being that there's a lot of preparatory work in terms of getting prepared to um, focus on and participate in the new normal. We are working closely with the Chief Justice from the very start. Um, we are moving away as a jurisdiction from the urgent caveat more to a consent basis where the parties are prepared to work remotely. The court is uh, prepared to hear them. Um, I heard uh, Douglas with respect to the criminal protocols. Uh, that discussion is not as mature, but it is something that will have to be contended with. Um, with respect to the membership, uh, there's been a call off. Uh, it, I don't have scientific data, but we have anecdotal reports along similar lines. And um, what we are dealing with right now is, uh, as our council, we are exploring the provision of workstations so that those who don't have the facilities can have a place to go um, with respect to participating in hearings and as, he's in the, as Doug was indicated, scanning and, and dealing with um, uh, e-filing and, and uh, lodging their, their documents. Um, this came at a time when our Chief Justice was very focused on e-filing and digital um, uh, processes. So the website had recently been launched. So some of these uh, plans have been accelerated. Uh, the reality is that in many respects, these things are the new normal. They, we won't be going back per se. I, I think that the physical um, infrastructure will, will, will stand as a backstop but the intention is to encourage a consistent use of, of the, the digital platforms. I think that it works well for us uh, as an archipelagic state to have as much access to um, digital means of, of, of engaging with the system as possible. And as a bar, we have, we have encouraged that. Um, as president, uh, we and bar council, we've been focused on 
mitigating the adverse impacts on um, council in terms of functioning in this time. Uh, the reality is, as Douglas mentioned again, that while assumptions had been made as to people's preparedness for working remotely, the reality is that um, this came upon us uh, like a thief in the night, and I, it wasn't as if, as if we were able to prepare ourselves for what we are encountering. So while people can get themselves ready, uh, it, it, it was not the case that everybody was in fact ready to work remotely. Um, but we are, we are in the process of readying ourselves. I think that we are working on protocols for how firms, how we recommend firms to practice and, and how we recommend social distancing and the other guidelines can be accommodated in the ordinary practice of law firms. Um, and we are working on engaging with membership and seeing uh, what their lived experience has been throughout uh, this pandemic. But that's where we are. Like I say, we, we, the judiciary and the bar has been working in tandem. We have just released some new guidelines as I was indicating with respect to how the registries would be working and how um, the, the judges would be approaching it. So um, things have been positive in that regard. We, we still have to do some work with respect to um, transactional work, the, the non-litigation areas of practice. We need to increase the, 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 the ability of those um, practitioners to, to um, complete their transactions and, and, and engage meaningfully on behalf of their clients. That's something that uh, is in some respects falls outside of the judiciary's control. And, and so we're gonna have to li liaise with the executive on that. But that is something we're also quite focused on. And I think that when we get some balance there, um, we will be in a better position, but we are definitely moving um, towards uh, business as unusual. And that's, <laughs> where, that's where we are right now. Yeah, thank you for that, Khalil. So interested to hear that you come up with the same practical solution in terms of hubs that lawyers could go to if they didn't have the equipment and the kit that they need, and that you've got into protocols and guidelines in cooperation with the judiciary, which is very much our, our aim here. Those guidelines and protocols have, I think, been developed largely by the judiciary, and we're told about them, but um, to some extent in cooperation with the bar as well. So all that's very encouraging. Thank you very much. So Brian, I think over to you at the moment. Yes, I see. <clears throat> Is Tenny available? Uh, can you hear? We cannot see you, Tenny, but can I know. you hear us? Good morning, all. My apologies for my late attendance. I got the... Well, my apologies, but I'm here. I'm the president of the Bar Association of Guyana. Well, yes, we I'm need... Uh, Tenny, I'm Brian Spears, the president of the Commonwealth Lawyers. You can see, hopefully, us. We, we can yes, see. Yes, I can. But could we hear from you um, a little bit about the situation in Guyana? And then I will follow up by going around our participants and uh, having my own questions and uh, topics for discussion. So, um, a, th a thumbnail sketch of where you are in Guyana, please, Tenny, would be really helpful. Well, the answer to your question would be home, because for the past, I would say, well, going on six to seven weeks, more or less operations for the save for certain emergency matters engaging the attention of the courts in Guyana, most of our matters have been shut down or suspended. There's a slow return to some sort of hearings we need to, in our approach, separate the high court approach to the, from the magistrate's court approach. There's one thing in common. The judiciary dictates to the bar what is going to happen. We are consulted in no way. So they just tell us, well, this is coming. We have a few practice directions. We provide no input into the content of those directions, and we just are to follow. The most recent practice direction has limited certain hearings to what they describe as emergency matters, some matrimonial matters. I see senior counsel Mendez from Trinidad would have been there. He knows that election matters in Guyana right now would have been 
considered as part of those emergency matters and a few other listed matters. We have no provisions for e-filing. There are, there's a varying approach among the judges. Some have hearings, some do not. We received a letter from the chancellor of our judiciary last week, last week, well, yeah, last week, indicating that there may be an adjustment to the mode of hearings going to video hearings after the 23rd of May. And the date is critical because our temporary COVID measures nationally, there will be a review on the 3rd of June but the legal profession and our interventions are occurring a few days, uh, well, the timelines end a few days after the national measures, or before, sorry, the national measures, so there's no coordination there. Our ancillary registries are closed, so we have no commercial registry functioning. We have no these registry functioning. We have no land registry functioning. We have been trying to get meetings with those registrars for weeks. We have not been able to do so. So things are technically at a standstill. We're not even able to file conveyancing, probates, non-contentious business is out. Additionally, not even existing pleadings or filings, which is a concern of the members of our profession here, we're not even able to do that. So. People, I would say we're on a vacation and it's getting a bit tiring because we're not being listened to as a bar. So those are, in a nutshell, that's where we are. Hopefully we're going to get to some sense of normalcy in due, well, the new normal as we hear it being described. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Tenny. That's, uh, <clears throat> that is uh, in an entirely unscripted way um, brings me ideally to uh, the next short and final phase of our chat, which is the impact on the profession as a whole and the fact that uh, everything really is interconnected. Uh, to get the economy moving, the banks need to lend, uh, they need to be secured uh, in order to carry out due diligence, the registries need to be available. Uh, the land registry or deeds registries need to be open and functioning. Uh, people need to be carrying out searches uh, in all sorts of places where information is up to date and reliable. And uh, that has uh, now received something more of a focus uh, in my jurisdiction of Northern Ireland, where we were very concerned about the lack of functionality of the registers and we engaged with the local uh, Minister for the Economy and um, were able to prioritise the reopening because there is an economic case that can be made. So just going round the houses again, uh, Rosalind, in terms of your membership and the impact and anything that uh, the, your Bar Association can do to assist, uh, has anything struck you as you've been listening to these experiences? or would you like to contribute a new thought uh, just briefly for us? Thank you, Brian. Um, yes, I have been sitting here madly scribbling a few thoughts. Um, the, I didn't really speak to the transactional and non-contentious matters earlier. We did have the situation in Barbados where the land registry was completely closed. The corporate registry was closed except for those things that you could do online and those are very limited functions. There was a large challenge with being unable to pay, for instance, transfer tax because the land registry has no, still has no mechanism for receiving money electronically. Um, the corporate registry and the land registry did not seem to have had a conversation between them about things that are pertinent to both within the context of a single transaction, such as registering a company's charge at corporate registry and then have a, having a limited time frame to provide a copy to the land registry if there was land involved. The land registry was closed. 
Um, we, the bar did reach out to the registrars to try to start that conversation, but uh, it apparently never happened. Now the registries are open, but with limited functionality, limited hours, you have to do your searches by appointment and so on. And that's really slowed things down in terms of carrying out and completing those kinds of transactions. Um, I, I like the idea of the bar working with members to try to provide support, technical support where possible. That's not going to be possible yet, simply because the bar office has had to remain closed. It is not a legal service that provides support to businesses. And that is the limitation that the lawyers are currently working with. I am hopeful that at the end of this week, when we have the next update from the government, there may be a further loosening of the reins to allow all kinds of legal services. But from the early days of the lockdown, um, we had sought an exemption from the Attorney General for lawyers to be able to do things like visit people who've been arrested. We got that one. Uh, go and assist people to prepare their wills. We didn't get that one. Uh, generally, just let us function so as to keep the courts going to the extent possible. Um, we, we do have to make the point that there is an economic reason why lawyers need to function. We have to be able to support businesses which are seeking financing, for instance, to keep their doors open and their employees on staff. Otherwise, the entire country will be looking for unemployment benefits, and that's not viable. So there is a role for lawyers and for bars to play in bringing some balance to the considerations. Health first, of course, but we're all healthy and we can't eat. Doesn't make sense. You have to, we have to try and help find that balance. Um, I, I do think that ADR will become more important as we try to, to move away from more complex ways of, of resolving cases. It's a very complex thing to have a matter in court. ADR is a much less technical, complex process. And I think we should be promoting that. Um, President, you have um, given a, a couple of ideas there. Sorry to cut across you, but I'm keen to bring no, that's fine. off the others. In terms of the functionality of the registries, um, I mean, that I think has been uh, overlooked. I I'm concerned that there remain some jurisdictions in the Commonwealth where the provision of legal services uh, and the bar associations are not regarded as uh, providers of essential services. Um, but that's been part of the interest that these discussions have taken place. Uh, I also like the idea of, of bar associations providing some um, communal help regarding uh, technology. And I suppose it was uh, Douglas that you had raised this issue as a possibility and could I turn then to Trinidad and, and uh, give a few reflections on uh, transactional work and how you are coping and maybe expand a little bit on your idea about communal centres where technology uh, might be available so that every practitioner doesn't need to have um, the upscaling of their technology that's obviously required. Yes, uh, Brian, I touched on, on the impact on the legal profession a bit when I was um, speaking earlier. Um, what Rosalind has said, I think that is reflected um, to a large extent here in Trinidad as well. The, the registries did not close as such, um, but there were difficulties because, of, of course, there were public servants who, who were not coming out to work, um, preferring to stay home and uh, there was breakdown in communication from time to time but uh, there were difficulties being experienced but the main complaint is the drop in the in the work 
that is available because even though the banks have remained essential um, essential services within our scheme the amount of work that they have um, to to uh, pass on to lawyers is, has dropped in accordance with the reports that they have had and similarly even though we are free to go to court there aren't very many matters being heard in court um, whether old matters or new matters effectively everything has been adjourned to um, June, July and, and going forward. So ability to earn has been affected as, as a consequence. The, the idea that we are toying with, as I've, as I've indicated, we are, we are presently um, costing it, is to use the, our existing facilities. The Law Association has um, it, its own building in Port of Spain. And we have a floor that we are renting out we're considering it at the moment, uh, I have to emphasize, um, to repurposing that floor as, as a video conferencing center, a business center where we, we have um, maybe scanning machines, photocopying machines, and so on that members who don't have the equipment can access. But also um, uh, having a center in San Fernando that's in the south of Trinidad and in central Trinidad, and also, of course, in Tobago, which is our sister isle. Um, but as I said, we're in the process of, of um, we're in the process of costing those to see exactly what we can afford. But I, I think that that is, is necessary because I don't think that the, particularly the younger members of the profession who are now trying to, to make it on their own will be able to afford that sort of technology. The, in order to be able to file documents in accordance with the guidelines of the judiciary, uh, 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 considering and, and putting out that is to say file documents where you are able to link various parts of the documents hyperlinked from one one place to the other requires the necessary software as my fact yesterday one of one of um, my chamber mates was demonstrating how it is done it appears to be easy I don't know if I can do it myself but it appears to be fairly simple um, but it is it, it also it will therefore require additional skills that that uh, maybe the, the staff of of, um, of of the legal firms will have to be be trained to do um, to make sure it's done properly and so on. But of course, it, the the judges are now insisting that that be done because it would make it easier for them. The uh, I think Peter mentioned earlier on that the Caribbean Court of Justice has had e-filing ever since it's it's um it started. Uh, is it more than 10, 15 years ago? I think it is but they they don't require you to file with hyperlinks so you'll get a, a thousand page two thousand page file and you basically have to scroll from the, the start to the finish in order to be able to get from one document to the other so there's a need to develop maybe to develop the the um, technology that is suited to e-filing i don't know if it exists anywhere but maybe we can share that information um, with the with our member bars as to what software exists that makes it easy to be able to move from one point of a document to the other or between files because sometimes you have a file that may be filed in volumes and not one file itself. So how do you move from one file to the other by just um, clicking a link? So all of that, all of those things are under discussion at the moment and certainly we would benefit here in Trinidad if, that, if a solution has been found elsewhere. Thank you, uh, Douglas. I'm sure that uh, if, if that technology and software exists, which it surely does, um, we would be pleased to uh, share that information with you. Just to round up the discussion, I'm going to turn to our other president um, of the Bahamas Bar. Um, Khalil, in terms of non-court work and transactional uh, functioning and support for members, do you have anything to share with us about what the BBA have been doing or contemplating? Um, yes, with, with, with certain registries closed, certain transactions can only go so far. And at this stage, we have really been an advocacy group in terms of working with the government, trying to get things open and trying to propose um, solutions that accord with the, the health directives that allow um, increased functionality um, with varying levels of success. We, we, we were able to get the wills access, um, but I was just doing what Ron's but uh, there, there was some resistance. I think that um, when the 
when it first began, when the, when the lockdown first began, you know, you had to deal with a, a sort of a state of shock. And I think that as things uh, calmed down, as people became used to what we were, were dealing with, then it was easier to navigate these waters. And um, as I said, uh, there's, in terms of the work that we can control in collaboration with the judiciary, We've had tremendous progress in allowing those things to, to be done, to work remotely, and, and, and we are very far along in that regard. We are less uh, far along with the, the government in terms of facilitating uh, some of the nuances of transactional work, but that is the, the, the current phase. I think that um, we were dealing with what we could deal with, that where we had a partner that was at item with us. Um, but now we're focused more on increasing that. And the, our members have, have been quite vocal in terms of providing feedback on what they need to get these things done. So that is um, a work in progress. But okay. we've had similar experiences from what I've heard from my colleagues on that side of, of, of the fence. Thanks, Khalil. Um, uh, my my uh, office developed what... Um, somewhat perhaps inappropriately is called the drive-by will, where in order to have the requisite number of witnesses present but socially distanced, um, one of my colleagues uh, you know, contrived her and her husband sitting in a car to watch the documents being executed through uh, somebody standing in the porch of their house and uh, handing documents over in, in envelopes with uh, rubber gloves and so on. So, mm -hmm. and of course, with an, a health episode and, and often proving fatal, uh, people do turn to the need to make wills and provision for their own affairs. Uh, mm -hmm. Khalil, we need to just get a couple of closing remarks from Bertha, but great to see you. And thanks yes, for and One thing on, on Douglas's point uh, with respect to the, the hyperlinked PDFs, when you a pair before the Privy Council, they are very focused on their working from their laptops. And um, I remember my first appearance, I sent in the CCJ style PDF, and they say, no, this won't do. And so they, they do require you to produce uh, PDFs that, that have the, the hyperlink. So the technology does, it, does exist. I, I have to rely on my assistant to deal with that. I, I can share uh, no further guidance in that regard, but as you indicated, it, it does exist, and it's something that, um, like I said, I'll look into it, I'll send a note to him. Well, thank you, Khalil. We're certainly all becoming uh, much more technologically proficient. Um, Bertha, as our council member for the uh, Caribbean, uh, do you have a, a, a sort of closing reflection for us before I turn to, to Peter for final reflections? Uh, most definitely, as uh, Rosaline has indicated, and so have you. I think uh, moving forward, um, I will follow up more seriously in terms of working on the ADR proposal. And we are particularly interested in you sharing, Brian, the e-notice um, that um, for mediation that uh, Ireland, Northern Ireland has issued. Thank you, uh, Bertha. And uh, I know that where, where colleagues have a passion for a particular subject, um, it's important to get it mentioned whenever we can. Uh, you might be interested that our Law Society of Northern Ireland uh, at its council meeting tomorrow, where we will have uh, 38 um, people attending by Zoom, will hopefully endorse a mediation policy that I have drafted, which I think will make the use of mediation uh, even more credible than it is and will drive uh, many property and inheritance and family disputes towards mediation. So I will update you offline, Bertha, in how the uh, acceptance of this policy goes tomorrow. Uh, Peter, you have uh, sat and been listening. You opened our discussion. I would like you to close our discussion with reflections that you have, and then we'll close the session by a few remarks from Derek and then a, a goodbye and thank you from me. But your, your closing thoughts, Peter, I would be interested to hear. Uh, Brian, I think this session has been extremely valuable. 
uh, it's shown that the the resources and responses across the region are uh, quite diverse. Uh, we, we have the experience of, of Tenny, for example, who certainly uh, can use the support of organizations such as the CLA uh, to, to, to assist him. And that I think also applies to the other areas where um, we have very much in common. Uh, we have not had on the call this morning, um, uh, the, we had the reference to Grenada uh, by, by Douglas, but there are quite a number of other countries in the Caribbean, as I mentioned at the outset, um, who may well share some of the frustrations that uh, Tenny has re referred to. And so uh, certainly the, the role of the, uh, the CLA is very important. I should also uh, mention the statement on emergency, uh, states of emergency issued by the CLA recently, a very valuable statement, very much applicable in this region as well, pointing out the, 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 the uh, caution, possible pitfalls that can arise as Douglas mentioned, and also Roslyn, um, the states of emergency have, have, have applied in different ways. Some countries have, have declared a, a state of emergency and lockdown. Others have, have, have taken a different kind of approach. And so that sort of guidance has been also so very helpful. And so I, 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 in, in my view, that this, uh, this session has been uh, very valuable, and I hope it will be the the start of even closer cooperation uh, across the CLA. I imagine, uh, I haven't seen it, but I imagine that the session regarding Africa and indeed the session regarding Asia uh, would reveal similar kinds of problems. And so these opportunities to share experiences and to provide support are, are, are very, very useful. Well, thank you, uh, Peter. Yes, the um, this is a, a health emergency and, and it has affected us all globally and in very similar ways. The statement to which you refer um, what is available on the CLA website and uh, I know that Derek might well have a, a thought in his closing remarks about the whole business of emergency legislation, rule of law, access to justice and what is um, passed in an emergency ought not to remain in a normality and that uh, phraseology was used in the CLA statement and um, you might have picked up Peter that in Malawi in a challenge to some of the constitutionality of their emergency legislation the CLA statement was in fact uh, referenced and uh, pled in aid of their representations which was very gratifying. Uh, Derek, um, I let you try and do your, you, you were so good in summing up in, in Asia, we'll see if you can do an even better job for the Caribbean, but I'll hand the floor to you now. Well, thank you, Brian. I think you, in fact, have touched on a really important point, which is that in a time of national emergency, such as we're, we're all going through at the moment, there is a great deal of consensus and support for measures which at any other time would be extreme, both in terms of their restriction on individual liberties and restricting access to justice. And that's our role. Our role is to be vigilant and to make sure that those things are not lost in the drive to combat this really wicked, nasty virus, that we stand back and we do realize that we have to make the case for access to justice and legal work in general being a core part of a functioning society and a necessary part of getting back to whatever normal is going to look like after we've finished. So I think that's an important part of what we've been discussing around the world and as Brian said many of the themes are common although the reaction to the problems is different from jurisdiction to jurisdiction and what it really underlines is the extent to which we all gain from sharing because we start from a common base we have many things in in common and there are lots of solutions which are worked up by versatile and resourceful lawyers in different jurisdictions which i i think are i've been making notes avidly as we've been going through the 
the uh, contributions today because there's a lot to learn and none of us have a monopoly really on good ideas. So I think I'd like to thank everyone for participating and for really giving us such a, 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 an eye-opening view of what is going on in the different jurisdictions in your region, the different solutions, and for pointing the way, I think, ahead uh, with solutions and ideas that I'm sure are going to seed themselves in other jurisdictions, given what we've been doing today and on other events as well. And there is, of course, now a particular beach in Barbados that's going to be on my bucket list whenever we can finally get back together um, and travel again. And I look forward to that. And it would be a particular pleasure, I think, to meet some of you face to face. And I hope that might be the case in the years to come. So thank you. And that's all from me. Uh, thank you, Derek. In fact, there are some splendid beaches in the Bahamas as well, where I hope that we will meet all of those on this line um, when we try and have our um, Commonwealth Law Conference in September 2021. Um, but as Derek has said, it, it's, it has been actually a, a great privilege and, and very humbling to meet such uh, earnest, um, well thought through comments from uh, serious colleagues, all of us who share a passion for uh, the rule of law, the integrity of the legal profession. And uh, that gives me great, uh, great hope, great pride, uh, a continuing pride in being a lawyer, that one can have a call like this and instantly connect with the Commonwealth family. Uh, I wish you all well. I thank you for your participation. I hope there will be a follow-up to these discussions and I'm sure that uh, Christian and the Bar Council of England and Wales will assemble thoughts and we might all then uh, do this again in a sort of more collective way. But for the meantime and for the uh, Zoom discussion with the Bar Council of England and Wales and the Commonwealth Lawyers Association, I say thank you very much indeed to the Caribbean region, to you all for participating. Have a lovely day today and we will keep in touch. But thank you very much and goodbye.